Okay, let's go. Another black game. And uh, he's going to play d4. Now, what do you guys want to see? Do you guys want to see a King's Indian? Yeah, let's play a King's Indian. My main opening, the love of my life, the King's Indian defense. I have been playing this consistently in the speed run, uh, in the five minute speed run. So the basic ideas should already be familiar to those of you who have been watching my stream regularly, d6. And uh, just to recap for those of you who are new, what kind of opening is the King's Indian? There is a descriptor that refers to a group of players who flourished around the 1920s, who made this audacious by those standards claim that you can actually give up control of the center and still be fine. Hypermodern, very good. Why are we fine? Because basically the hypermodern is claimed that uh, you could attack the center from afar, using your pieces kind of as snipers and using your pawns in a very tempered fashion. Not you know, like a million pawns in the center, but rather pushing one pawn into the center. But that one pawn is doing more than oftentimes four or five pawns. All right. Did I scare you guys? <laughs> okay. Now, what is the main move here? Which pawn are we using to strike at white center? E5. And uh, D5 played by Aditya, by Demon. I will explain afterwards why this does not blunder a pawn. There is a very simple tactical justification. The move c5 is possible. I have also played it many times, but it is more in the style of Benoni. c5 offers a slightly different bent on the position. We want to maintain the King's Indian spirit. And d5 is a great way to... This is the Petrosian, uh, this is, uh, the Petrosian variation. One second... Sankona, thank you for the prep. So this closes down the center, which, much like in the Nairov, leads to a situation where the sides usually attack on opposite sides of the board. White generally attacks on the queen side, black on the king side. But before we do any attacking, we need to complete our development. In particular, we need to develop this knight on b8. If we are to approach this carefully, we will see that the move d5 creates a very nice parking spot for this knight. And that parking spot is on c5. We can go knight a6 or knight d7. And then we park the knight on c5. It exerts pressure on the e4 pawn. And in order to avoid parking tickets, we can cement that knight after he defends the pawn with what move? Yeah, so a5 is also possible, but the move is a5. What does a5 prevent? It prevents white from chasing away the knight with b2 to b4. This is one of the most foundational ideas in the King's Indian. You will see this all the time. That doesn't mean black cannot play these positions without putting the knight on c5. There are alternative ways of developing. You can actually de 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 uh, delay the development of the knight for a while, but this is like the old reliable approach. So Aditya has to defend this pawn, right? He, he can't go b4 immediately because he will give up his central pawn. That is a disaster. Um, so white has several ways of defending. Yeah, knight d2 is one of them. And now we go a5 to stop before is this hopefully this is making sense Aditya yeah now who can tell me now that we have established the knight on c5 how does black actually begin the king side attack it's all well and good to, to look at white's king and say we're going to checkmate it great talk all you want what are we going to do we are going to push that f pawn out to f5 are we going to do it by jumping over the knight no we're going to move the knight away usually to e8 or h5 h5 is inaccessible here because bishop takes h5 but if white's knight remained on f3 knight h5 would be a very nice move then we are going to push that pawn out we're going to open the gate we're going to push that pawn out and then we're going to close the gate at some point by pushing the knight back to f6 applying even more pressure on e4 hope everybody is following so far this pressure on e4 is often going to force white to play f3 and then we are going to lock up the king side with f4. Watch this happen in the game. He's probably going to play f3. That's the classic reaction because the pressure on this pawn becomes super strong. And after f3, we close down the king side with f4. But we do so temporarily. We do so with the knowledge that we are going to reopen this with what further idea? This is as classic King's Indian attack as it gets. What is the follow-up here? And... Yeah, G now I wouldn't necessarily have played a four in a real game. 
Uh, there are more nuanced ways of approaching this, but I want to showcase the typical ideas. Yes, g5 and g4. We are going to push out that g-pawn. We are essentially going to attack the base of this pawn chain. But before we do anything, we need to make sure that this knight is properly secured. We need to make sure its seat belt is fastened. Can we add a little bit? Yeah, b6. Adds a little bit of beef to the knight. We certainly don't want to go g5 immediately because after taking, yeah, we have to take with the d-pawn and that kills the integrity of the pawn chain. So let's use that b-pawn. Let's delegate it the very important task of supporting the knight. If white takes on c5, we take with the b-pawn and we have the vampire teeth, new concept, on the queen side this time, which make b4 very difficult to achieve. Does this actually threaten anything? No, c7 is not hanging. We can go ahead and play g5. Okay, to those of you who actually play the King's Indian, this is all review, uh, but hopefully I am making a fair amount of sense to those of you who don't play it. It's still a good idea to observe how this stuff goes. Now, how are we going to, how are we going to actually get g4 to work? Because right now it would blunder upon. There are three main methods of accomplishing g4. One is, as I explained, to bring the knight back to f6. The other, less common, but in my opinion, super cool and underestimated, is a rook lift. Lift the rook to g6 and then play g4. And guess what? If you get this done, then that rook is going to be very well poised to take advantage of the g file once it opens up. Thank you, 200 bits. Yeah, that is Fen Beingold. You're right. The third method, less least common, is to play h5. Generally, this is not necessary unless white plays h3. Because why not prepare g4 with a piece? Why leave the knight on e8 where it's passive? Which one do you guys want to see here? All three are fine, but I want to hear the one that's coolest. Nah, rook. We got to lift the rook. Guys, we got to lift the rook. Now, that doesn't mean we can't combine these things. We can play rook to g6, then we can lift the knight up, but that might not be necessary. Yeah, we can go g4 immediately. Let's go look at this rook, x-raying the king. This is where the king's Indian gets fun. This is where... You start looking for these very pretty tactics that are inimitably, indelibly part of the King's Indian. Okay, Bishop F4 is panic. That is a creative move. I see what he wants, but it's not going to. I think he wants this. Yeah, he wants to open up an attack on the Rook, but this is just a day late and a dollar short. Because for one thing, we can move the Rook. That's fine. But what's the simplest? Another 200. Thank you. Oh, it was hanging. Oh my god, he blundered the Bishop. I got it. I didn't even see that the bishop was hanging. Yeah, yeah, you guys are right. Uh, that just hung the bishop. But now we are going to not miss that a second time. We're going to take the bishop. And then we're going to take on e5 and be up a piece. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a typical situation. So I just kind of blindly followed this. Believe it or not, I am after four hours. I am human. <laughs> and now we're going to take on e5. The best kind of attack. We are up a piece and we are attacking. Okay. Okay, so now we we can take on f3, but we do not have to rush with that. Uh, actually, we, we can rush with that because uh, there is a very strong follow-up move to this. After queen takes f3, ding, 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 rook and queen on the same diagonal. We have a bishop. Where do we put it? We put it on g4, pinning queen to the rook. We win another exchange. We are up a rook there. And then the G file is open. So the game is over. Yeah, that was nice. Well, I am commemorating 8,000 subs, which I freaking cannot believe. We have 5,000 viewers and we are not even stopping here. So, huh. And we got a $5 donation from the Virox as well, which I had missed. My, my apologies. So thank you so much to everybody for this unbelievable level of support. 8,000 and counting. <laughs> Unbelievable. 844. Takes, takes. Let's bring the queen in. Threaten checkmate. Pile up on the G file. Many ways to win this game. This is the most straightforward. Okay. Now we have an explosive way to capitalize on the pressure we are exerting. Do not forget that pawns can be full fledged attackers. On f3, he can't take it because of the pin. If he doesn't take it, then we will take g2, exposing his king even further. 
and leading to quick checkmate. Okay. So, yeah, most of this will be on YouTube. The 10 minute speed run that we've been doing in kind of impromptu fashion, I will decide how to incorporate that. But every day a new video comes out on the speed run 1850 is where the YouTube is at right now. Um, now, by the way, in this position, let's finish this game though. Uh, it's very important to indicate, well, actually, like, what, what should we, how do we actually end this game? What's the simplest? Yeah, the simplest, well, bishop d4 blunders the bishop, right? He's, yeah, I would just take, take and take. That's the simplest, right? No need to reinvent the wheel here. And uh, we should notice that if this queen on d1 were to cease its control of the g1 square, we would have a tactic where we basically force the king out of g1 via this move or that move, and then we promote a new queen and ladder checkmate him with rook h6. That's a common technique, by the way. Uh, and the issue with white is that and that's exactly what's going to happen here. That's a very pretty move, queen h2, but it's very typical. Then we, we are going to promote a queen. And the new queen is going to be better than the old queen. Because that king is going to be uh, driven out of its little cocoon on g1. And the simplest is queen g3 checkmate. That's the fastest. Good game. Promoting to a rook would not be good. All right. Great introduction here to the king's Indian. And um, I've talked about it a fair amount in the five minute speed run, so I'm not going to rehash everything time and time again. But um, where did a DTS start going wrong? So D5 is a legitimate move. That's the Petrosian variation. Now D takes E5, the exchange. Uh, if white takes on E5, then we should notice that the knight is in the crosshairs of the bishop, which means we should start looking for discovered attacks against that knight, which means that we should move this knight not just anywhere, but to a square where it where it produces the most damage, right? And the most damage is, is produced by taking the pawn on e4, restoring material equality. And black is doing great here because he's got this diagonal and he's got this very juicy d4 square for the knight as well, okay? So this is good for black. Now, um, d5 is possible. The main line is just to castle here and retain the tension. d5 closes up the center and a detail played very well up until, I mean, this is fine, but here, Aditya, you started to sort of make these slow moves. The problem in the King's Indian is that it's very, very deceptive. It's hard to play with white because it may not seem like white is in any danger whatsoever. The king looks perfectly safe. It's the calm before the storm. Many games have been lost like this. So your moves kind of make sense. Yes, you're improving your position, but you are letting me develop my attack without really starting anything on the queen side. Now, in order to make progress on the queen side, white must find a way to get this b4 pawn break in. Now, you guys might look at this and say, no problem, I'm just gonna play a3, and then I'm gonna play b4. What's the big whoop? Well, there is a big whoop. What does black have in response to a3? That is the move a4. Using on passant, weaponized on passant. If you go b4, here comes the on passant. And this is a disaster because if you take on b3, you drop the pawn. But even if you weren't to drop the pawn, the effect of b4 has been completely uh, demolished by this on passant. So in order to actually do this and circumvent the a4 idea, white must play b3. Then a3, the idea is that a4 is now met with b4 and there's no on passant because the pawn has only moved one square. Then you are still not ready to play b4, why? because Mr. Undefended Rooks here is going to complain. So we have to either move the Rook out of the way, but first we need to defend this pawn. Let's play F3. Then we move the Rook out of the way, or we can defend the Rook by developing the Bishop. And we are finally ready to play B4, which chases the Knight away, which in turn creates a kind of domino effect. Because once the Knight is gone from C5, White can himself play C5, which is the main way that White makes progress in the King's Indian. Many games have been won this way. That is where the King's Indian derives its reputation. As a very, very sharp opening. White has this incredibly strong queenside attack. And I didn't faithfully represent how black would play. Black will attack on the king side. And it produces these incredibly chaotic positions. Um, so a lot of people at this point, if I'm reading the chat right, some of you are definitely thinking like, wait a second. So black is going for checkmate and white is going for like a queenside attack. How is that? 
fun for white. I mean, why is anybody playing this with white? Well, the reality is, uh, in a certain sense, the bar for succeeding on the queen side is lower than the bar for succeeding on the king side. Um, delivering checkmate is very hard, particularly since white's king side is not without defenders. It, on the other hand, for white to actually break through and start winning everything on the queen side is not that difficult. It requires only like four or five moves, and then black is already going to be at the gates of hell. That d6 pawn collapses, and then like dominoes, everything kind of falls. So you can think of it this way. What benefits black is the fact that uh, black is going for checkmate. So black can sack a bunch of stuff and give checkmate. What benefits white is the fact that white's attack runs more smoothly and is easier to achieve than black's attack. You get this counterbalancing factor and you get absolutely fascinating positions in all lines of the King's Indian. Uh, so what the King's Indian teaches you to do is so many different things, to play chaotic positions, to play both defensive and attacking chess at the same time, basically fighting off an enemy with one sword, fighting off an enemy with a shield, and fighting a different fight with a sword. That is one of the hardest skills in chess because most people have a one-track mind. They are either defending or attacking at the same time. Sorry, they are either defending or attacking at one time. It's very hard to do both at the same time and to do it well. And yet that is very necessary to play the King's Indian well. In light of this, none of this should be surprising in G5, lifting the rook up to prepare g4. If white had gone h3 to stop g4, we would have simply gone h5 to reinforce that threat. The King's Indian is extremely popular at the high level and has been for many, many years. Yeah, I forgot this bishop was hanging. No, I mean, Timur Rajabov is one of the world's leading specialists in the King's Indian. And uh, he, uh, you know, he just won the, the air things open. So uh, King's Indian is probably the most popular opening among grandmasters uh, on a sort of per capita basis, I think. And uh, it's not necessarily the best opening, it's just one way of playing, uh, but it is probably the only way to guarantee, virtually guarantee a very sharp position right out of the opening. Okay, 1400. Okay, let's go e4. Let's go e4. And uh, let's see what happens here. <laughs> it depends on the position. Spassky was a goon. Spassky was an absolute good. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you. Okay. So, um, what opening shall we play? Knight f3. All right. Uh, we can play many different openings. We can play the Scotch. We can play the Italian. But um, I'm going to show you guys. Now, let's play, mm, let's play the Scotch. In fact, let's actually play... The Scotch Gambit. Now, the Scotch Gambit is like a cross between a Scotch and an Italian. It is an opening that often slips through the cracks. I highly recommend it for those of you who play the Evans Gambit and are looking for an alternative. It is super dangerous at this level. It is actually played by Grandmasters. It is a very legitimate weapon at the very highest levels as well. At somewhat lower levels, of course, it can bring quick victories because there's a bunch of traps in this line. Now, essentially... Think of it, and d6 played by Will is... I actually played this myself with black. It leads to a slightly worse position. It's a good way to avoid the traps. The way that you guys should think about this is it's like in Italian. Why do you play this move first? You play this move largely to open up your access to the g5 square. Because in many lines, this knight g5 or bishop g5 is a very important aspect of it. So Will decides to give back the pawn and instead open up the diagonal for his bishop. We, of course, have a very nice position here. We have better central control. We have a bishop on c4, kind of like a good scotch. Uh, and uh, we've recovered the sacrificed pawn. After the game, I'll talk a little bit about the theory of the scotch gambit. Let me just write this down. One moment. Okay, let's take a shot of the sketch. Yeah, so Will thinking about how to develop his pieces. I mean, he shouldn't overthink it. Now, would it be a good idea, according to our logic for black to, is, okay, let me put it another way. Should we be afraid of black taking on d4 as white? 
Should we be afraid of the queen being in the center? No. And the reason why is that he doesn't have another knight on b8 to put on c6. That queen on d4 is going to be perfectly well placed. In fact, I'm pretty sure we had this position through a different opening in the speedrun, maybe through the Philidor move order, where black is super solid, extremely solid. Uh, black is a nice you know, pawn here that restrains the e-pawn. You should not try to lunge at black's throat here. You should rather nurture your advantage, bring all the pieces out, and enjoy the fact that white has a nice space advantage and nicely placed pieces. Who can propose for me a developing move? And this is where things get very tricky. This is actually a much trickier position than it appears. So uh, prepare to put on your tactical hats. Now, f4 is a little premature because we haven't developed our queen side, you know, I am a little bit worried about f4. Oh my god, five bucks from just a Twitch smurf. Low elo games are a bigger mess than Capitol Hill. Yeah, perhaps, perhaps. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, I, I don't I turn off the alerts in the meantime. So bishop e3 or bishop g5 both seem very natural, but both of these moves end up being susceptible to two different types of tactics. There's a lot to explain here. Let me try to be quick and then afterwards I'll explain in more depth. Bishop e3 allows a tactic that I have indicated many times in the speedrun, which is what? First of all, knight g4 is unpleasant. First of all, knight g4 is unpleasant. But second of all, it is the move knight takes e4. What? Isn't that a blunder? No, nope. knight takes e4. And now d5 to recover the piece. And that leads to mass trades, and we don't want mass trades. So here's what I want you guys to do. Can you give me a move that permanently prevents black from having this in his pocket. When we make, bingo, bishop b3, and guess what? We put the bishop on a defended square. That's essentially what we are doing, and we're moving it away from the wrath of the pawn. The move f3, I completely understand why you would play it, but it is a little bit weakening, you know, never play f3. But no, f3 is possible. f3 would be a very viable alternative since you could move the bishop out to e3 and cover immediately the diagonal weakened by the move f3. So f3 would be also quite good. But here I want to play this without f3. I want to play bishop b3 and I want to see what Will is going to do here. Mm. And we get a raid. Just dojo live right in party 50. Thank you, David. I'm on the tail end of my stream doing my final speedrun game of the day. 8,000 plus subs today. Amazing stream. We are rounding it off. But thank you so much. Appreciate the raid. Okay, knight e5 is a bit of an odd move because, yeah, now this walks right into a, um, I know, over a thousand subs. It would be insane. We don't need to play h3. We can, we can strike. This knight on e5 is not stable. Yeah, let's get it out of there. And we control more of the center. The reason I dismissed f4 here is because it doesn't come with tempo. And now that the bishop is on a safer square, f4 is a little bit more justified. It's a little bit safer. Now we have more control of the center. We still probably want to complete our development at some point, although the immediate bishop e3 might still run into knight g4. So we have some things to solve here, but we will. Okay, bishop g4. This is the kind of move which should not intimidate you. Thank you, Candelon, for the prime, because it attacks the queen, but that's literally all it does. That bishop can actually get into a lot of trouble. Where should we put our queen? Well, as we know, the way we think about such positions, we want to put the queen on a square where it is also potentially doing something, right? We only have two squares, d2. Well, d2 can be tossed out immediately. That's just a super awkward move. d3 is under control of the knight. So queen to e1, because we can also bring the queen later to the g3 square. We are not blocking the bishop. Uh, you know, sometimes you really can reason with very simple logic. There is nothing wrong with that. Simplicity uh, does not mean, you know, that you are somehow missing the point of the position. Sometimes the correct logic is simple logic. And simple does not mean easy. Oh my, yeah. Oh, I thought I missed the 35k tone. I was like, I don't know. Okay. Now we are anticipating that we'll, we'll move his knight, he does. But now I indicated, well, queen d2 would basically block the bishop and Think of it this way. The queen on e1 is also good because it could later move to g3 and x the king. Yeah, so h3. And the bishop is in trouble. Um, Will does have a way to 
I think tactically extricate his bishop, but let's see if he plays it, and it doesn't entirely solve all of his problems. Now, you guys are like, wait a second, trapping the bishop, doesn't he have bishop e6? If he goes bishop e6, what happens? Which way do we take that bishop? We not only win a pawn, we win more than a pawn. We win the exchange. How? Not f5, because then he has this way out. By we play bishop takes e6. f takes e6, and knight takes e6, forking queen of the rook. Okay. Um, if he goes bishop h5, then the method by which we trap the bishop is very straightforward. We push the pawn out to g4. Bishop drops back to g6, and we play f5, cornering the bishop. Some of you might be looking at this line and saying, well, how do I know that it's justified to move another pawn in front of the king? And the way that I know this is that black simply doesn't have any firepower near the king's side. And in addition, winning a piece is a pretty significant event. Third, thirdly, we can always bring the queen in to g3, and the queen can also fulfill the defensive role, simply lending some shelter, you know, putting the umbrella over white's king. Will decides to give up the bishop immediately, out of curiosity, who can spot the, the way that I just referenced to extricate this bishop without losing material? The move that you should really be looking for here is a counterattack. Good, c5 counterattack in the knight. And if the knight moves away, first of all, the bishop can take the knight. But second of all, the bishop can then drop back to e6. And of course, the e6 square is no longer covered twice. So this is a little bit of panic because now, ooh, now we have an additional square for the knight, which was not particularly effective previously very important thing to do do not just automatically submissively drop the knight back to f3 think about how the position has changed as a result of a trade in this case as a result of us winning the bishop the f5 square has cleared off for the knight knife f5 look at all of our pieces now are going to be aimed at the king side so in addition to our extra piece we are about to develop if i'm reading the situation right an incredibly incredibly powerful attacking mechanism Whew. Man, 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 what a stream. What a stream. No, position is <laughs> position is better for Ross. Up a piece. If we didn't have an extra piece, white would still probably be better. Okay, what should we do? Yeah, so e5 is also great. In fact, e5 might even be better. Yeah, I actually love e5. See, queen g3 runs into one small problem which is how is black going to defend against the checkmate threat it's not going to be knight h5 that knight on h5 is going to be very flimsy uh the move is actually g6 and that's again sets up a kind of biting on granite situation where if we then play queen takes g6 of course the h pawn takes because this pawn is pinned um but um that is actually not the best way to play e5 is really good because we essentially the way you should think about a move like this is you're opening up a second front. You're opening up a second front, by which I mean you are holding in your pocket. Yes, maybe later we'll play queen g3, but we are also attacking down the middle. And when you combine these two things, you'll just see that we're crushing black's position like a bug. Thank you, Eric. Uh, Eric, uh, her on music. Now, knight h5, worry not. Yes, we cannot play queen g3, no big deal. What can we do? How do we fulfill the center attack noticing that the bishop on b3 can be actualized with the move e6 it's sorry it's potential can be actualized with the move e6 this is crushing we're attacking the knight the pawn the bishop is going to fall as well it's also type 2 undefended piece you guys can see that type 2 undefended pieces are important to notice this is something that i actually did notice when i played knight f5 i made a mental note to myself wait a minute it's bishop on e7 guess what type 2 undefended and what's defending at the queen what do we know about the queen as a defender Queen is not a very good defender. So by opening up the e-file, we are also helping exploit the weakness of the bishop. Type 2 undefended piece, a piece that is protected by only one other piece. It does not include pawns. Type 1 undefended is what we traditionally think of as an undefended piece, which is a piece that, like the knight on h5, is not protected by any other pieces. Okay. So knight on h5 is type two sorry type one knight d7 and bishop e7 are both type two undefended so black's minor pieces are not in a very good way here yes type one undefended is the same as a hanging piece you can call it that as well okay so here of course oh actually 
if you guys want to be fancy, you know what we can do. Okay, what 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 is the like obvious move here? And then I'll show you guys something funny. So the obvious move is of course EF7, but we can actually take the bishop first if we want. Because if he takes on E7 now, we play E takes F7 there, and we actually win the queen. Even if he plays rook F7, that rook is going to be pinned. So we can take his queen. So we can play this little sneaky move, just transposition of moves. Now we play E takes F7. The queen is defending the knight. We are up two pieces, and look at this pawn. Black's king, funnily enough, is safe for the time being, but... <laughs> That is not going to bring black any kind of relief. The rest is a simple matter of consolidating our pieces, making sure that we are not uh, playing in too cavalier fashion, making sure that, you know, the white king is also not too safe. So uh, you always want to maintain control over the position. Wow, next hope. I, that warms my heart to see comments like those. I'm so happy uh, that you are, are learning and welcome, welcome to the community. Uh, so, so happy to see so many people getting better. And I am honored to play a very small part in that. So that is another uh, non-trivial reward from streaming to such an awesome community. Okay, so queen b6 creates a, a standoff with a king or an x-ray. And when you identify x-rays, you, like, you can't just stop there. You need to ask yourself, okay, is there actually a threat that is associated with that x-ray and here the answer is yes what is that threat how do we prevent it there are several ways to prevent it yeah so bishop b3 so first of all c4 check right c4 check is the annoying threat but other than bishop e3 and you guys should think of this and tie it into the ways that we have of um stopping a threat so how do we stop a threat uh the traditional way is to make that move ineffective, but we can also try to take out the piece that is that is essentially creating the threat itself, if you guys see what I mean. So here what this translates to, we can play a move like bishop e3 or queen e3, but that's a little bit passive because then this piece has really only one role, which is to reduce the x-ray. But instead we can try to target this queen. By targeting this queen, we are essentially targeting the cause of the problem rather than the symptoms. You guys are proposing some good moves. Knight d5 is great, but there is a move that nobody has proposed yet. Arab, one, two, three, four, and thank you for the sub spirit ham, which is the move queen e6 using the queen trade as a weapon. Look at what this move accomplishes. If you go c4 check, he loses the queen. Black can drop his queen back to a7 and keep the x-ray. But then the queen on e6 is beautifully positioned. Look at how it's right in black's grill and uh, whatever black does, then we can play bishop e3. And the queen essentially has made its way in front of the bishop. Then all of our pieces are perfectly placed. So we're simply improving the position of the queen. A queen trade plays entirely into white's hands here because we're up two pieces. That doesn't mean we have to do that. There are many possible moves. Knight d5 is great. Even king h1, a couple of you proposed, nothing wrong with that. Queen b4 played by black. Now we, we have uh, gotten rid of the x-ray, which means we can focus on completing our development without having to worry about these ideas. What should we do? How should we complete our development? And yes, I'm talking about completing our development, even though we're up two pieces. That does not change the fact that you need to adhere to basic opening principles. And g5 is now the most accurate, I think an active square for the bishop, I might say. So, yeah, he can give us a check on d4. Yeah, bishop h6 is possible, but as my coach would always say, you are not writing a book uh, during... You're not trying to write a tactics book during a tournament. You're trying to win games. There was an Australian international master uh, by the name of Purdy who echoed that sentiment. He had a quote that I like. He said, you know, you play in a tournament uh, to win points, not to paint pictures. And that's not entirely true. It's good to paint pictures and win points, but you should not paint pictures at the cost of not winning points, especially when you're up a bunch of pieces. Resist the urge to do something crazy when easy does it. Okay, it's good to play beautifully, but you shouldn't play beautifully when that in any way sort of jeopardizes an otherwise simple win. Yeah, we can bring the queen back now to e3. 
uh, again offering the queen trade and again forcing this queen tossing it around then we can bring the rook into the open file okay so both of these sentiments are the same it might seem weird or, or disingenuous hypocritical for me to be saying this but i don't believe it is um because beauty comes from first and foremost i i think necessity uh, what is that expression? Necessity is the mother of all inventions, right? Um, so what makes something truly beautiful, I think one of the qualifying factors, this is, by the way, guys, one of the reasons why I think the opera game is so overrated is because it was not necessary to do the kind of stuff that Morphe did. It was very pretty. It was very instructive. But black played so badly that white had multiple simple methods of achieving a huge advantage. And I think what distinguishes a game as truly beautiful is the fact that the beautiful sequence was also necessary. It was the only way to accomplish what needed to be accomplished. Okay, so he gives up the rook and resigns. Good game, Will. And, uh, okay, so the Scotch Gambit, before we end, a quick overview. So there are actually two main moves that Black has here. The first is to defend the pawn. The second is to, is to counterattack White's pawn. If knight f6, then white goes e5 and attacks the knight. And here black has a super important counter-attacking move. Without this move, the scotch gambit would be <laughs> refuting e4, e5. That is the move d5, attacking the bishop. Very common idea. This The point is to occupy the center and to open up the light squared bishop. And then you go bishop b 5 You get this very sharp and very interesting pawn structure, which I will not delve into right now. But if you're on the lookout for a new opening, this is very worth, very much worth considering, even if you're rated 2000. I'm telling you, this is played at a grandmaster level. So this is a very legitimate opening. That's number one. Number two is bishop c5. Here white plays c3. And this is a very venomous move because if d takes c3, what can white do in this position? Using a concept we have outlined time and time again, undefended pieces. The bishop on c5 is undefended. The mupwa, most popular wrong answer, is queen to d5. You might look at this and say, ah, fork. But before you play a move that seems to win via a fork, you ask yourself, can my opponent make a move and defend against both threats at the same time? Queens are actually good at that very specific subtask of defending. Queen e7. And unfortunately, if you go bishop g5, uh, black can go f6, and black has warded off the attack. C takes b2 is also a huge threat actually cb even here uh so for that reason we we simply change up the move order we take first on f7 now we give a check and we essentially can take the pawn equal material but black is a very very weak king permanently and uh white white has a very fun position white is not winning here but this is not considered a good line for black this is super fun this is not pre-recorded no okay um, so for that reason, knight f6 here is the main move. And then you get this again, e5, d5. And you get a similar position to the knight f6 line. Again, very rich, very tactical, very interesting. So d6 is fine. I played this myself. Uh, and black gets a very solid position. So here again, bishop b3, right? Stopping knight takes e4. Uh, knight e5, I think, is the root of the, the problems. I think that the way to play this with black is... You don't need to... Well, first of all, you can take on d4 and develop the bishop to e6. When you are, are cramped, when you are cramped, uh, it's a good idea sometimes to trade off a couple of pieces to lighten the burden a little bit. And particularly, this bishop on b3 is a beast. White is better. White is a nice position. But black is super solid because black has no weaknesses. After knight e5, f4, bishop g4, I think, is almost the decisive mistake. I think that probably the best thing to do, as my old coach Gregory Kaidanov, very strong grandmaster, would always say, to say sorry. Just go back to c6. Yes, f4 is, is a nasty thing to allow, but black is still not lost. Black is still very solid. That pawn on d6 acts as a kind of barrier to white playing e5. So still more or less fine. If Daniel were to make an opening course, what's your pick? That's actually a really good poll. Let me write down the info here. King's Indian, that, yeah, I think King's Indian is starting to win. Left arms. And that's actually something that would be a labor of love for me because 
I need to formalize my analysis in many different lines. This would actually help me. Yeah, so I think King's Indian, if I do make an opening course, that might be the one that I kind of settle on, as it seems from the from the pull. Uh, okay. Ooh, Crawford of Crab is online. Yeah, King's Gambit is fine, uh, but not extraordinary. And after Bishop G4, the last uh, idea was to play C5. Attack the knight on d4, force it to move, and then either take on f3, and at least you don't lose the bishop, or drop the, better yet, drop the bishop back to e6. Nasty position for black, weaknesses all over the place, but black is not down material. Black can more or less survive here. Okay? Um, thank you for the YouTube shout out. Uh, every sub counts on the YouTube. I really appreciate not only people's support on Twitch, but also on YouTube. We're at 115k subs my goal is to hit a million one day and uh you know this this really really helps so thank you for the incredibly positive feedback on the speedrun videos and asia orbit subbing at tier one thanks for that as well well i don't really i don't know i'm not a big background art kind of person i like the chessboard that's basically it okay uh learn scotch game yeah so at this level, you kind of do need to learn the theory of these basic responses, at least just a couple of moves. You don't have to go crazy. If you just know to play d5, you're going to get a decent position. And here, improvising from a position of strength allows you to get a playable position. The problem happens when you really don't know what to do from the very start. Then it can be hard to like find on your own something like this, even for a grandmaster. Okay. So Maurice Ashley had, had a lecture talking about E4 being in a slightly overrated. Not true. I don't think he said exactly that. I, I mean, I didn't see that lecture, but could you perhaps explain the context in which he said this? Because I don't think anybody thinks that E4 is a better move than D4, other than Bobby Fischer, E4 being best by test. But even he kind of said it in an allegorical kind of way. E4 is like the romantic move but nowadays uh d4 and e4 are considered largely equivalent even knight f3 and c4 uh have their place yeah i think that uh, hey joe i i, I think that, the, that what, what maurice might be trying to imply here is that and and this is a point i would totally 100 percent agree with e4 does not like always you cannot guarantee that uh, you will get like super tactical positions and checkmate your opponent every. You need to be prepared for positional battles, even in E4 openings. You can't gambit your way to, to grandmaster them. You need to try to become well-rounded from a relatively early stage. So maybe I'm not without putting words in his mouth. Maybe that's partially what it is he's trying to, to get at. And I think that's a, a great point. <clears throat> okay, guys.